everybody knows Guy. Um, half the people here probably know Guy. The other half will be happy they know Guy. Guy works as a developer evangelist. If you'd like to know more about what they do, there's a YouTube channel with Guy talking about, um, a YouTube video about Guy um, talking about what he does as a developer evangelist slash advocate and what he doesn't do. Guy has been a coder for how many years? Uh, 25 plus. And you most likely met him at a company called Pillar. Is that fair to say? I was there for five years. Yep. Is there anything else I should add? He lives in Columbus, Ohio, not Michigan, but we'll forgive him for that. And it is what it is, right? And, I'm not uh, you, from Columbus, so I don't care about the football thing. Yeah, and they canceled <laughs> the game this year because Michigan didn't want to lose. Yeah. <laughs> I grew that, up in Northern Ohio watching the Browns lose, and so I am i don't watch football because it was painful. Uh, <laughs> so is there anything else, Guy, anything else interesting to know about you? Uh, I don't think so, um, but uh, I, I have a slide where I'll – Talk all about me. You know. <laughs> yeah. And how would you like questions? I know you like to answer questions. Uh, so uh, we got a small group here uh, on, on Zoom. If you've got a question, just ask me. Just um, unmute yourself and ask. I'm, I'll be happy to uh, um, answer that question. And uh, if you want to put it in the chat, uh, I probably won't be watching the chat because I'm going to be busy on my slides and everything else. But uh, if, uh, uh, Joel, if you see a question come up in chat or on chat on like YouTube or Yep. Twitch or one of those. Feel free to pause and interrupt me, and uh, I'll answer the question to the best of my I like ability. interrupting people. See uh, it work. Yeah, you're perfect at it, right? It's, it's that right there is a talent. Don't a hide practice. that in a bushel basket. Ask my wife how much I practice. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, so we can kick this thing off. Uh, we'll share desktop two, and there you can see a, a very boring Mac screen. <laughs> And then we will present a slide. There we go. Can everyone see my screen? Excellent. So welcome to Mystery Machine Learning, Jinkies. Um, here's my little intro slide. Guy Royce, developer advocate, Redis Labs. Um, probably the most valuable line on, uh, on this slide is this one right here that says uh, github.com slash Guy Royce. Uh, all the code for all the stuff I'm going to show you tonight is going to be out there on GitHub, and there'll be a link to it later, too, so don't feel like you got to grab it. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Guy Royce uh, if you're so inclined. Uh, I mostly just post updates about things that I have going on, and I'll post things that I think are funny, um, and that's about it. And I'll occasionally troll people that, are, that I know in responses. And uh, if you want to read my out-of-date blog, that's at guy.dev. So... Um, so that's me. Uh, a very important fact about me uh, that's relevant to this talk is summed up in this uh, initialization here. It's not an acronym because you can't pronounce it. Um, well, I suppose you could pronounce it, but it wouldn't be safe for work then. Um, but uh, this uh, initialization is uh, an important fact about me re relevant to this talk. Any uh, ideas of what it might stand for? I am not a something. Yep. I am not a developer. <laughs> <laughs> data scientist. Data scientist. That's correct. I am not a data scientist. Uh, I'm going to do a talk on data science, but I'm coming at it as a fan of data science. Uh, I'm a developer. I think like a developer. I don't have a heavy math background, and so I try to take the uh, machine learning concepts and turn them into uh, more intuitive things that I can uh, share with everyone, uh, which I, th I think is useful. Um, and as a developer, I'm more it's more how to use these tools, right? Uh, so what I do is I go out and I figure out how to do stuff with these uh, various machine learning tools and data science tools, and then I do something, and then I share what I've learned. Um, there are other ways to solve these problems. I don't know them all. Uh, I'm, I'm basically saying I'm not an expert. Um, and partly, uh, I'm not an expert because I hate the phrase expert, uh, because it says so much, but it doesn't say anything at all. But also in this particular case, uh, this is, you know, I don't have the years and years of math training to be a, a data scientist. It's, it's a hard profession. Uh, I'm a developer that plays with data science and share stuff. So, um, so that's my little disclaimer at the beginning of my talk. Uh, in addition to not being a data scientist, I am a big fan of Scooby-Doo. Uh, well, I probably, probably more fair to say I was a big fan of Scooby-Doo. I mean, I'm 48 now, and so I don't really watch Scooby-Doo like I used to. But as a kid, I enjoyed Scooby-Doo thoroughly. 
Um, and, you know, the thing with Scooby-Doo is uh, they always had a mystery to solve, right? And it was always just some man in a mask uh, that was uh, uh, the secret ghost behind everything. And uh, that mystery that uh, they needed to solve, well, I want to solve a mystery too. And um, our mystery is identifying who said what was a line or a quote, which, which uh, member of mystery incorporated would that quote be uh, uh, credited to, you know, someone says jinkies. Well, who is that? That's that'd be Velma, right? Uh, if someone says, Hey gang, let's split up. Oh, that'd be Fred. And you know, if someone goes, <laughs> well, then that would be Scooby-Doo, right? <laughs> And so what I'm going to do is we're going to build a machine learning model, a recurrent neural network that you can type these lines into, and it will tell you who said them. Uh, and it'll, it'll be doing natural language processing to figure out, uh, even if you have words that the model doesn't recognize, like if you bring stuff in from the SpongeBob universe into Scooby-Doo in your things you wanted to uh, make a prediction on, it will still work. So it's not just a database looking these lines up. It's actually... Uh, trying to understand that language and make a prediction. In order to do this, uh, I've got a data set uh, of all of the lines that Shaggy, Scooby, Daphne, Fred, and Velma say uh, in from various uh, movies and cartoons. So went out, someone went out, got all these scripts, built a data set. The data set is literally, the first column is a CSV file. The first column is who said it. And the second column is what they said. That's the data set. That's all the data we have to train this thing with. We're going to use that data to build a neural network that will tell us who said it. And we're going to take that neural network and we're going to deploy it onto Redis using Redis AI. And then uh, we're going to build an application that will take uh, the, use that model that's in Redis AI uh, to make predictions and tell us whether it's uh, you know Daphne or Fred or Scooby or Shaggy or Velma that said the thing. That's what we're doing tonight, which I think is kind of fun and ridiculous. Um, topics we're gonna cover in doing that is we're gonna look at neural networks. And I'm gonna look at neural networks in detail uh, so that we can kind of get down to a, a first principles sort of view of it. Maybe not all the way down to first principles, but uh, we're gonna look at neural networks down at how they work at the neuron level. And then you can see how they aggregate together. And then uh, we're gonna look at recurrent neural networks, which are particularly a variety of neural networks that are, uh, that are configured in, in a particular way that makes them good at dealing with time series data. And then we're gonna look at how we can build both of these types of neural networks using Keras, uh, which is a Python library uh, that's part of TensorFlow. That's sort of like a DSL for uh, a domain specific language for building uh, neural networks. And then we're gonna look at how we can take these models and put them on Redis AI and wrap them up in an application. Um, my clients are in JavaScript, uh, but you know you could use any language you want. So that's what we're gonna build. So let's dive into uh, what are neural networks first. So uh, this is uh, a picture of a neural network that you've probably seen before. Uh, if anyone has touched machine learning type topics at all, you've probably seen this sort of basic picture. And what it's showing here is uh, an input layer. So we got a bunch of X's coming in, input layer. I did them zero based because I'm a programmer and not a data scientist. If I was a mathematician, these would be uh, X sub one, X sub two, three, and four, but I, I wanted to be zero based. But so we got this input layer. We got numbers coming into this, this neural network. And each of those uh, input bubbles represents a single number coming in. We got a couple of hidden layers. So all those input layers, then the outputs of those go to the hidden layer and all the outputs of each of those hidden layers goes to the next layer. And you can see that it's fully connected. So the output of say this neuron right here goes to every single neuron in the next layer. And then we get have an output layer which has three numbers as output. And so this is sort of, you can think of this as a function. It, it is a function. It takes inputs, it transforms them in some way and it creates an outputs or outputs. And uh, this is a function, not just in, in the programming sense but really more in the, the math sense. Um, where you know you put x in, you get y out. And so uh, functions like that in math are responsible for drawing lines. And so this function will draw a line. Uh, that line can be uh, all kinds of shapes. And we can use those lines for a couple of purposes. And technically, this isn't a line. 
I'm, I'm showing it as a line because it actually fits on the screen that way. But depending on how many variables of input you have and how many variables of output you have, you're actually creating a, um, a hyperplane that bisects uh, a space. And so in this case, our hyperplane is a line, which is a one-dimensional structure, bisecting a two-dimensional structure, which is the space. But you could have a plane bisecting a space, a three-dimensional space. You could have a five-dimensional hyperplane bisecting a six-dimensional space, et cetera. So, but it's, but we, those are hard to vis visualize and hurt our brains. So we, we just do two-dimensional stuff. And so this line can, like I said, bisect this space. And so you can use that line to classify. You could say, is this thing on this side of the line or the other side of the line? Is it a hot dog? Is it not a hot dog? And you know, so you put in your data, it plots a point and you say, hey, I'm on the Southeast side of the line, not a hot dog. I'm on the Northwest side of the line, I, it's a hot dog. Scoob, not scoob, right? Uh, so that's one way, this is called classification. And so you can take that line being drawn by that neural network and use that to do classification. Uh, you can do this with other types of machine learning as well. Uh, the other thing you can do with that line is you can uh, plot a point on it. Um, and instead of getting a class, is it this thing or this other thing, you can instead get a value. And so here we have a, a little graph that's showing the, uh, the number of Scooby snacks required uh, to get Scooby or Shaggy to do a thing based on the spookiness level. And so, you know, many times in the show, it's like, would you do it for a Scooby snack? Uh -uh, uh -uh, right. Uh, and then, so the question became, well, would you do it for two Scooby snacks? And here we can see that clearly this uh, regression line shows us, this line shows us that at this point, uh, a spookiness level of two would be uh, met by two Scooby snacks. So two Scooby snacks would be enough uh, to get Scooby to face a spookiness level two challenge. <laughs> uh, and this is called regression. And instead of providing a, uh, a category, it provides a, uh, a continuous number. So at any point along this line would work. Now this is a real simple one, obviously. And it's saying uh, one Scooby snack for a spookiness level of one, two for two, three for three. And so it's real simple, but you know, this, this line could be much more interestingly shaped. It doesn't have to be th this simple. And again, it's not two, it doesn't have to be two dimensional. You could have 10 variables and then all of a sudden you've got this line that's being, or this, uh, this hyperplane that's being drawn through all those dimensions. No. So that's kind of what a neural network does is it draws these lines and then lets us determine whether this is, uh, you know, do classification or do regression. And uh, so let's break down the neural network and look at a single neuron. Here we have the simplest neuron possible. It has a single input, X, and a single output, Y. And so this, this is not a realistic neuron because neurons usually have multiple inputs, but we'll start here and then we'll expand. And so uh, if you say it's got input X, output Y, that's gonna draw a line, right? If you plot that out, you four X, what's the location Y? Four X, what's the location Y? Uh, and you can plot it out. Inside of this neuron, to help it calculate, uh, this, to draw this line, it has a weight. And uh, what we do is we multiply that weight times the input. So X times W. And it has a bias. And that bias is added to that multiplication. And so this is how uh, it computes the value for Y. And if you're paying attention, uh, we could express it uh, algebraically like this, where uh, there's our input. W is our weight. We add a bias of B and that yields an output of y. And if you're really paying attention, you'll notice that this is actually y equals mx plus b, which you probably remember from, from algebra one, right? It's a formula for drawing a line. Uh, you know, you got the slope, you got the y-intercept. The y-intercept is the bias, the slope is the weight. Um, in fact, it's, I think it's kind of funny because all you <laughs> turn the w upside down and it actually is exactly that formula. So it's, you know, so obviously, that, that it's kind of, it's kind of funny. Uh, and so uh, what it means is a neuron like this, this basic neuron draws a straight line. That's what they do. They draw straight lines. And those lines could go lots of different directions. They could have different angles and, you know, that's what the slope and the bias do or the slope and the, uh, the Y intercept do. And so, um, yeah, it draws us some lines, but that's not always what we want. 
like if we had a, a layer of straight lines being drawn and then it feeds into the next layer of straight lines being drawn, then we're just going to get another straight line, which means that we only get straight lines out of our neural network. And so we need to do something to change that output in that neuron. We need to make it less linear. And we do that with an activation function. And so if you think of the, the entire neural network as a, as a function, now it's made of smaller functions and that smaller function has a function inside of it. So it's, you know, it's like a matryoshka functions. Um, and so that activation function uh, can be a couple of uh, varieties. There's lots of, lots of choices here and there's, but there's really the one that everyone uses. Uh, so a couple of the choices are uh, sigmoid. So that this can take your line and turn it, uh, you know, that number th that's output, the Y value and turn it into a value from zero to one. Approaches one, approaches zero. If, if your value is uh, a zero, it hangs out at 0.5. And then it goes up and it goes down. So you're, you're getting that number that approaches one. It flattens it out. It, it narrows it down. Another one that is popular is a hyperbolic tangent. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing as a sigmoid, but taller. And instead of hovering around uh, 0.5, it hovers around zero. And then it approaches one and it approaches negative one. It doesn't reach it, but the, you know, the bigger the number, the closer it is to one. But the, uh, the one that's used the most, and actually the easiest one to explain, is uh, the rectified linear units, uh, or ReLU. Uh, ReLU is a fancy way of saying max 0, comma x. So if for x, a particular value of x, if it's 0 or more, it is what it is. Otherwise, it's 0. So if I give it a 5, ReLU puts, spits out a 5. If I give it a negative 1, ReLU spits out a 0. And... Um, this is uh, by far the most, I'm, I'm going to say by far the most used uh, uh, function in uh, activation function in neural networks. Uh, it just seems to work really well. I'm sure there's a mathematical proof that shows you why that works. I don't know. I just know that it works when I use it. So, um, so that's one way of transforming it. And so then you, you, get a, you don't get a straight line anymore. You get that line like that from a neuron. And these, these um, real neurons aren't taking one input. They're actually taking multiple inputs. So here we've got multiple X inputs and a single Y output from this particular neuron. And again, we've got the weights and we've got the bias and we multiply the weights times the inputs. We add the bias, run them through our activation function and we get a Y. And so it looks like this. Uh, X times W plus X times W plus X times W plus B equals Y. And this is drawing that hyperplane through that space. And uh, to express it a little more mathematically, we can say it's the sum of the uh, inputs times the weights plus the bias. So that's sort of a neural network at the lowest level that I can uh, effectively describe it. Um, once you have that neural network, then you can see that, that that's what's happening inside of all these. So you're drawing these kind of crazy shaped lines, these, these you know, relu ish lines. And then those values feed into the next layer, which feed into the next layer. And all of a sudden the lines that you get out of the neural network uh, aren't straight anymore. Uh, they're all kinds of curvy, interesting stuff. And it allows you to make interesting lines to do interesting classifications. And so uh, this is a simple function that I wrote to, uh, to draw some little lines. I just used the grapher tool in, uh, in the, on the Mac to do this, but um, and so you can start cutting that space up and classifying it, or you can start regressing on it. So it's all about drawing interestingly shaped lines. That's really what machine learning does. <laughs> so one thing about uh, these types of neural networks that I've just explained though, is that they actually, uh, well, they suck at data that has any kind of chronology to it, right? So if it's got some sort of uh, this happened before this and this other thing happened after this, if you just, you could build a neural network and say, I want to put in 10 words and I'm going to turn them into numbers somehow. And then you tell me words out, but it doesn't know which words actually come first. There's no order implied by the structure of the neural network. Recurrent neural network uh, provides that, that, that imply that order, that time series nature. And so they're good for things that have time series data. Like uh, you could do it for like stock market predictions Although um, I have some questions as to whether that is very effective. If I could 
do machine learning to predict the stock market, I wouldn't be talking to you about machine learning. I'd be predicting the stock market and retiring had, early. Yeah, we had this conversation once. And what I remember you telling me is the moment you optimize for a pattern, the pattern changes. Yeah, it's it's the, I think it's called a level two complex system or something like that, where uh, the prediction of what the complex system will do uh, when utilized changes the system. And then there's other types of complex systems where you can make predictions, but acting on the information doesn't actually change the complex system. The stock market changes when you modify your behavior as a result of making predictions against it, which ultimately drives the stock market towards greater efficiency. And then everyone does it. And then everyone just has to do it to compete. <laughs> and, the, and then you're back where you started. Versus a, a complex system. What's that? It's a chaotic system versus a complex system. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a couple different terms. I, I saw one. It was like a, a level one. They called it a level one and a level two one time, but yeah, chaotic versus complex is much, much better. Uh, and probably what smarter people than me say. <laughs> so, um, but a recurrent, recurrent neural network's good at that. And one of the things that's sequential data like that is language. And so recurrent neural networks are, are good for doing that. Uh, it has an input layer, just like a regular neural network has an output layer, just like a regular neural network. And uh, these circles here can be, uh, I'm going to say for now that they're individual float values, but we'll see that they'll turn into actually input layers as opposed to just an input itself. So like X sub zero is actually have many, has many values coming into it. And then they've got uh, hidden layers, just like a regular neural network does, but they're a little different. These hidden layers are totally just a hidden layer, just like in the previous network. But what we do is we take this first input and we run it into that, uh, that, that hidden layer and it generates an output. That output goes into the next layer, providing the context of the uh, inferencing that happened from that first word being put in, that first bit of data from the time series. And then uh, this layer takes that previous computation, that previous result, and takes the next thing in the sequence and then uses those two things to make a prediction which goes into the next layer. And so it's it, the neural network gets that sense of temporality and it gets that, that context of the previous words or the previous data. So it can find patterns that uh, go over time. And then eventually we'll go ahead and output these things. And we can output uh, multiple values or a single value. There's lots of ways to configure these. Uh, but the thing that makes the neural network different is it's still neurons connecting in exactly the same way, but it's, they're wired up differently in a way that provides knowledge of the past. You can set these up in a many-to-many -many arrangement where you, you put in multiple values and you get multiple values out. A, a classic example of this uh, would be for translation. So uh, you put uh, Shaggy saying something in English on one end and Scoob says something in Scooby speak on the other end. Um, you can also use these for chatbots. So this would, this would be an example of the Scoob chatbot. Uh, you know, Shaggy says, look out, Scoob. What would Scooby say in response? Well, this could predict what Scooby should say in response. Uh, he would say, okay, Reggie. Um, and so there's, there's that many-to-many -many structure. Um, uh, you know, that's one way of doing these. Not, not the example we're going to do tonight, but it's one way of doing them. Um, another uh, structure you can do is you can do a one-to-many. Uh, one to many takes one input and then generates multiple outputs. And so it doesn't have the context of necessarily the input history, but it has the context of the previous things it's predicted. And so with this, uh, probably the best use case for this is image captioning. And so this input layer could be the result of a uh, convolutional neural network. And, uh, and then it could look and see what things are in that image and then caption it and tell you what's in it. You could also use it to generate text, but it's if you say say something that Daphne would say, it would just always say the same thing. So it's not nearly as interesting. Uh, but you know, th maybe we give it a picture of Daphne and it predicts that she would say Jeepers, they mean business. But it's taking a single input and then generating multiple outputs. And we got the one we're going to use tonight, which is the many to one. And in the many to one, uh, you can take uh, multiple inputs, you get a single output, many to one, right? Um, this is great for sentiment analysis. So you give it a, a line and it spits out a number saying, is this a positive or negative review on Amazon? 
You can do it for uh, predictive text. Given these words that I've entered so far, what would be a good next word for me? That also works with many to many. I can say, here's all my words. Give me three words that I'm likely to say next. Uh, and uh, for what we're gonna use it for, we're gonna do text classification. So take this text and put it into some sort of classification, some category, some bucket. Our example is gonna be who said it, Shaggy, Scoob, Daphne, Fred, or Velma. Uh, hey, let's split up. That would be Fred. Um, but uh, these buckets could be things like, I've read the context of this email and we're going to route it to uh, the collections department versus the customer service department versus the uh, you know, level two support or whatever, right? So you could, you could direct, you could do lots of things to classify this text. And lo lots of practical uses for this pattern as well. We're gonna do the impractical ones tonight. Um, so we're gonna look at how we're gonna classify text. We're gonna classify something that Velma says Velma is always saying, I can't see without my glasses. That's sort of her thing. And when we look at this, you know, I'm showing a picture of Velma as the output and I'm showing text as input. But machine learning models, deep learning models, neural networks, none of these things actually work on text. They work on numbers. And so we need to turn our input into numbers and we need to turn our output in, from numbers into a class. And so uh, the way we turn our numbers into words is using a thing called tokenization. And so we start with uh, our data set. Now here we've got a, a data set of 24 words uh, from this corpus of text. We've got jeepers and uh, raggy relp and like step on a scoob. These are all words and, and we know who said them, but we're gonna take that corpus of text, the, all the lines from the Scooby-Doo uh, data set that I have, and we're gonna turn them into um, well, basically an index. Um, so we count them all up, putting the most populous uh, common words first and the least common words later in the list. And we just give them an index from one to N. So we've got 24 words. Uh, like is the most common word. Well, like and raggy are both the most common word, but like is alphabetically first, so I put it first. And so that gets an index of one, raggy gets an index of two, glasses three, all the way down to zoinks with a 24. And this is, you know, now, now each of these words can be numbers. This is really a no different than the substitution cipher that you used to use when you were a kid. Uh, so if we take our little substitution thing here and we want to encode the word, I can't see without my glasses, we look I up on the list. It's got an index, a number of 10. So it's 10 and can't is a number eight. And we just map it out and we get a little vector that contains these words. We've taken these uh, words and turned them into numbers. Um, this is like doing uh, A equals one, B equals two, C equals three to uh, encode a message uh, when, you, when you were a kid. Uh, same idea, slightly more advanced. Uh, one thing you might have noticed is that this, um, this example had missing words, right? So um, there was, there's not a word there in the first input. And so uh, we, we have a null there. And the neural network requires us, this particular example requires us to input seven words, but we only have six words. And so we have a null. And so what we do is we map that null. Um, you'll notice that null isn't in here. You'll also notice that I started with a one and I made a joke earlier about being a programmer and I always start with a zero. And um, well, that's because the null uh, gets the zero. So if there's not a word in a position, you get the zero. Uh, or if the word's not in the dictionary. So if we build up these, these words and then we give it a word it's never seen before, like uh, spectacles. We've got glasses, we don't have spectacles. Uh, then spectacles gets turned into a zero. So this is the way we sort of handle things we don't recognize and the way we handle things that uh, just aren't needed. And we always write justify our words because it's temporal, right? The leftmost stuff is the oldest stuff. And, the, and so we... Uh, the, so the further the thing, the further in the past the data is, the further to the left the data is, the less important it will be to, uh, the, uh, to the recurrent neural network. And so we want everything to push everything to the right. So if this is in a real example, I think my input width is 150. So we get, you get padded with a bunch of zeros and then just a few words at the end for most of our examples. Once we do that, once we've got uh, that list of words, this is a, uh, I can't see without my glasses, null, I can't see without my glasses. Uh, we now need to one hot encode these. 
And so uh, instead of each uh, each input on the recurrent neural network just taking a single value, they're actually going to take a vector. And that vector is going to be full of zeros and have a one for the particular word. So one hot encoding says uh, word 10 is position 10. It's the word I. Put a one there, everything else is zero. Word two is uh, can't. So put a one in can't, put zero and everything else. So we're one hot encoding these. So these value, these arrays now would be going into, into the, into the uh, input on the neural network. Except that's not actually what's gonna come in next because we wanna do another thing to, you know, like if we have a dictionary 10,000 words, that means we have a really wide, we have a lot of inputs and they're mostly zeros. And so there's this idea of word embedding. And what word embedding does is it creates a matrix of, uh, of words to look up. So here we have uh, this big matrix that is uh, six wide and it's as tall as the number of words we have. And the numbers in here sort of uh, encode the semantic meaning of that, the meaning of that word. So words that are more closely related in meaning will have larger numbers that are the same. So like glasses here, we have a 75. If spectacles were in our set, that's a very similar meaning to, um, to glasses. And so spectacles would have a large number in this column as well. Whereas a smaller number in this column would mean there, it's not as related to that concept. So these columns sort of end up meaning sort of semantic categories. And the bigger the number, the more this thing fits into this category. It's showing how closely related these words are in, in concept. And uh, I know that uh, Karis takes care of this for me. I don't actually know how it builds this matrix. I know I tell it to build it and it does, uh, but I don't know what it's doing internally to make that happen. So, um, but uh, what we do with this matrix is we take our one hot encoded word and we find the row that matches it. So uh, glasses is our one hot encoded value. And so we get the row that matches that. And so this one, two, zero, 14, 75, zero is now, this row is now what's input into our neural network for that input. So if we look at this, now we'll see that null is all zeros because there's nothing there. I is 102. And if we go back to the previous slide, you'll see that, um, uh, I, well, I don't know if I did it. Uh, there's glasses, we'll look one, two, one, zero, one, 14. Uh, uh, one, two, zero, 14, 75, zero. So that, that row gets put as the input for the word glasses. Uh, my gets input right here, et cetera, et cetera. So we're just taking, we're doing a lookup and that becomes our new input. So this is what actually gets put into this neural network. What's really being output is not Velma. What's being output is instead a vector of numbers equal to uh, the number of classes we have. So we've got five values being put out here and they should add up to one. Uh, and each of these five values corresponds to one of the members of Mystery Incorporated. And so uh, we take the largest value. And so the model is 83% certain that that's Velma, 11% Scoob, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is how we take those numbers and turn those back into classes. So that's pretty much all there is for how recurrent neural networks uh, do what they do. Um, one important thing about this, and I hinted at it earlier, is the vanishing gradient problem. So what happens here is, I, I mentioned how uh, this input here is influenced, this, this box right here, right, is made up of the previous results and the, the current input. And things in the past become less important. But that's not always true, especially with natural language processing. Uh, just because the word's first doesn't mean it's less important. And so, but what happens with a recurrent neural network is all the way here on the right, this last uh, hidden layer is taking glasses and it's taking the result of everything that came before it. And the result of everything that came before it is half of the decision process. And glasses is half of the decision process. And then my is half of that. And so words that are way, way, way back at the beginning that might be really important um, don't have as much weight in determining what our output is. And so we'll be able to show this once I, I show the model because I can put things in like, I'll put in things like, like I can't see without my glasses, Scoob, or I can't see without my glasses, 
Scoob. And that last word, Scoob, tends to mean something Shaggy says. And so even though Velma would most likely be the one to say, I can't see without my glasses, Scoob, it, it, that Scoob is, uh, is overly um, weighted. And so this is a flaw with uh, uh, this basic recurrent neural network. The solution is to use uh, some more advanced uh, recurrent neural networks. There's the LSTM, which is long short-term memory, and it hangs on to things that it thinks are important. And I don't profess to know how these work. I haven't researched them in detail yet. Uh, gated recurrent unit does something similar uh, using a different mechanism. But it's the idea of trying to, in essence, the recurrent neural network has only short-term memory. Um, and so uh, these are trying to give it some long-term memory along the way so that it can have some context that it can, can hang on to how important a word is or might be. So those are things to go research if you want to go deeper into this topic. We're going to look at Keras next and how we can use Keras to build a recurrent neural network and just a regular neural network. Uh, Keras is a uh, domain-specific language that makes writing neural networks really easy. So you're not uh, doing a bunch of math. You're saying, build me, a, give me a layer with this and give me a layer like that and give me a layer like this. And so you're just specifying, you're talking in terms of the neural network itself. Uh, it's written for Python developers. It's a Python library. And it's part of TensorFlow. Uh, it wasn't originally, but it was incorporated in TensorFlow. And so to define a simple neural network, this would be the sort where uh, I, I showed at the beginning, the full feed forward neural network. Uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, create a new model. It's called a sequential. And it's called a sequential because it's uh, a model that's made up of a sequence of layers. So it's got this layer, and then it's got this layer, and it's got this layer, and this layer in sequence. So that makes it sequential. Um, we will add a layer. We'll say model.add. We'll say we want a dense layer with five neurons. Make the activation function out of those neurons uh, relu. That'd be the max zero comma x. And uh, go ahead and specify the input shape as well, which defines our input layer. The input shape is four. It has, it's a four comma, so that, uh, so that Python knows it's a tuple. Uh, you can have input layers that are multidimensional if you're doing like image classification and stuff like that. And so uh, these define our first two layers. Then we can define another layer, dense five, activation relu. Define our output layer, also a dense layer, dense meaning fully connected uh, with three neurons. And then this has an activation of softmax. Softmax takes um, the numeric outputs of those three neurons and makes sure that they add up to one proportionally. So just like with uh, Mystery Inc, we had the five members, we got five numbers out, they all added up to one. We could think of them as, as a percentage. Softmax is what makes that happen. Once we've defined what the, our model's layers are, we can say model.compile. We give it an optimizer, a loss function, and the metrics that we want to report out. Uh, the loss function uh, is telling us how wrong it is. So it's a measure of how incorrect the model is. And so uh, as we go through the model and run values through it, we're going to get answers. Those answers are going to be wrong. The loss function is how we measure how wrong they are. The optimizer is Adam. The optimizer is responsible for adjusting the weights and biases in the neural network to new values that are closer to uh, the direction that the uh, loss function tells them they should be. And uh, we're using Adam. That's a type of stochastic gradient descent, which uh, are words that I know how to say. <laughs> uh, I actually kind of know what they mean. Uh, it's, it's using calculus to uh, find that, figure out how to move that line, the lines up and down and adjust the slope level. And um, it's stochastic because you use some randomness to do that. It's gradient because you keep getting smaller and smaller, just like the vanishing gradient problem. And it's descent because you're trying to get down to that sweet spot. There's a big U-shaped thing that you're trying to find the bottom of. So you're descending along the gradient using random numbers. So, um, but that optimizer, uh, Adam is, is doing that and it will figure out how to adjust all the uh, weights and biases to get closer to what the loss function says. Loss function is figuring out who to blame and the optimizer is figuring out how to adjust the values. Um, and so once we compile it, then we can train it. We, we call model.fit. 
And here we've got some training data and some training labels. X train is uh, is the the inputs. It's all the input data. It's all the yellow bubbles right here. Uh, y train is all the expected outputs. So this is the thing it's going to look at and say, nope, this is the answer we should have got. Uh, go optimize that and make it better. Batch size is 20. That means go through 20 records before we do the loss optimizer thing. Epochs is 10. That means go through the entire set of data 10 times. So we go through the set data set 10 times in groups of 20. So that's what that means. Uh, once that's done, we can evaluate the model, uh, giving it data that we've set aside. So we, we got our initial data. We took 80% of it and we used it to train the model. We take 20% of it and use it to evaluate how good the model is. And uh, evaluate, in, in this case with Keras Evaluate, we'll just spit something out to the console that tells you how, uh, what the loss is like and what the accuracy is like. Once we have this model, even if we don't evaluate it, we can still use it. Uh, we say model.predict and pass it in some values for x, and it will give us back a prediction. So this is actually pretty easy code for dealing with neural networks. Um, you're just dealing, I mean, the, the hard part is knowing, should I use ReLU? Should I use Atom? What kind of loss function should I know, uh, use? And there's some, there's not a ton of choices necessarily for certain types of problems. <clears throat> like I always, for classification problems, I usually use categorical cross entropy. Atom seems to work well for most things. Um, but there's lots of stuff to read on what to choose on, uh, on, the, on the Googles and the internets. And RNN is actually just a variation of this. And so we got to start with the same new sequential, but instead we create an embedding layer. And that embedding layer is the thing that one hot encodes and uh, does that uh, word matrix uh, thing that we saw earlier. And we tell it, you know, give it all the dimensions it needs. So we get say, we are, your input into your embedding is a word that is, you know, it is gonna be the dictionary size wide. Uh, the output is going to be uh, how many embedding columns we have. So that'd be the seven, the six columns we had for the semantic meaning. And then the input length is how many of them you have. So uh, this is saying uh, how wide the input is into the embedding layer. This is saying how big the output of the embedding layer should be. This is saying how many inputs are going into uh, our neural network. And then we add a simple RNN after that. And it needs to know the number of embedding columns as well so that in here it can know what to expect in its inputs. And then um, we give it a dense output layer of five. That'd be five classes, one for Shaggy, Scoob, Daphne, Velma, and Fred. And that's how we build an RNN. Same basic idea though, we're just using different types of layers. We ready for a demo? Like guys talked a lot. Maybe he should show us that this stuff's real. Okay, so I'll go ahead and show you my data here. Uh, is, this, is this text big enough or should I embiggen it a bit more? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and embiggen it slightly. Actually, no, I'm not. There we go. So uh, this is that data I, I said before, we got you know each character and their line. So here's Shaggy Rogers, like gee whiz, shouldn't we have landed in Paris by now? You know, that, that sounds like something Shaggy would say. Uh, and we just got the five members of Mr. Ink in here and go all the way down to the bottom here and see uh, there's Velma Dinkley saying, I can't find my glasses. <laughs> so there's our data. I have built a little script that will uh, do all these things I talked about. And so um, here I read in the data, data training data using pandas and I do some transforming to make it a little more usable here. Um, so I get my features, I get my labels. So this is an array of all the features. This is an array of all the labels. Um, and then I need to encode the labels. That would be, the labels would be Daphne, Fred. It'd be the five members of Mystery Inc. And so I'm gonna use a label encoder from scikit-learn. And then I need to one hot encode them. So I got a de uh, two categorical from uh, Keras. So I create a new encoder. I hand it the labels. It creates an encoder. Uh, if we look at the encoder when I run this, uh, we can get the classes out of it. It'll just give us a list of the classes, which is just the names of the five members in Mr. Inc. 
In fact, I, I, it generates here. That's that's what I, I save that out as. So there's the five members of Mystery Inc. And we are going to use this encoder later uh, to decode the uh, the output. And here I just save it off. And we are also yeah here we are we're taking the encoder and we're transforming the labels from strings to numbers that the model can understand. And then so this takes uh, the the strings and uh, turns them into zero through four for the five members of Mr. Inc. This then turns them into one hot encoded inputs. So instead of zero through four, you have five numbers with zeros and ones, zeros and one one. And so now we have one hot encoded data. Um, now we need to take um, our words and tokenize them, our lines. And so we set a max vocabulary of 10,000 words and a max line length of 150 words. So we can't do, we can't do more than 150 words of text. Uh, we create a tokenizer of that size. We say, go tear through all the text and map all those numbers, all those words to numbers, count them up. And the most common word gets number one and the next common, most common word gets number two, all the way down to the least common word. And I have uh, right here, word index is uh, most common word is the, probably should have removed stop words. Uh, U to a I like, like comes up a lot. Like, what are we gonna do now, Scoob? And um, all the way down here to the last word, which is eyeballs, <laughs> which I just think is kind of a funny last word. I don't know why. Um, so, that's what our tokenizer contains, right? That's our word index. That's that's what it's doing. Um, we turn our text into those sequences, into those uh, those arrays of numbers using text to sequences. We pad a bunch of zeros to the left of it because that's what we're going to do for recurrent neural networks to to help reduce the impact of the vanishing gradient problem. And then I go ahead and save the word index out to a file. And then I take the data, the, these features and labels. This is all the data that I'm going to use to train the model. And I split them 80-20. Uh, and that's what this little line here does. Uh, once I've split them 80-20, I can do the code that I showed you earlier on the slides, where uh, I'm going to create an embedding layer, a sequential model, uh, a simple RNN, and an output layer of dense. It's got a length and the number of classes, which is the, the five members. And then I compile it using Atom cross uh, categorical cross entropy and uh, metrics of accuracy. Uh, now I uh, now that it's compiled, I can train it uh, or using the fit method, and I can evaluate it, and then I can actually make some predictions. And this is a lot of code for just taking words and using those things to turn them into numbers and everything again. Um, but the, the important thing is is that we loop through a couple of results, and then we save our models out to disk for use with Redis AI later. So this is the code I wrote. I'm going to actually run it now, uh, not in this terminal. Yes, yes, in this terminal. Python build model.py. Let's go ahead and push that guy up so you can see it better. And so here it's going through the epochs in batches of 20 or 10, whatever I set it to. And you can see the accuracy is increasing and the loss is going down. And then we do evaluate and the accuracy gets absolutely terrible and the loss gets really terrible and gets really big. And this is because I'm not a data scientist. <laughs> Um, this model is overfit. Uh, it's memorized a lot of the answers that are in the, the training data and then the test data, it doesn't know what to do with. Um, and um, if, uh, you know, there's a, the lesson in here is that as a developer, I should not brazenly go out and say, I can do machine learning. I can do data science. I need to work with the data scientist who understands how to, to manage this data and, and, and fix these sorts of things. With time, I, I could have worked with someone to fix this. Uh, but it actually works better as an object lesson uh, for developers to uh, not be too arrogant and assume that they can just master this. This stuff you know, is actually hard. Um, but also this model works well enough for my purposes to show how I can host it. So uh, it, it, it being uh, a crappy model does not diminish the learning that we're having. So we can see that I did some predictions here. So we put in jinkies and it says it's likely said by Velma Dinkley which it would have been. Um, and then uh, here's, here's our sequence of words coming in. 153 is jinkies. The rest of them are padded with zeros. And it gives us 80% that that's Velma Dinkley. 
Here we got like hang on Scoob. That's obviously Shaggy. And it got a 95.7% as Shaggy. And Roke Raggy got a 92.99% that it was Scoob. So, and this is Roke and that's Raggy. <laughs> um, and then I, I, and then we save the files up. So this is actually making predictions. It's working for their sort of their catchphrases, but for more generic lines that anyone could say, it, it fumbles. And I think that's part of the reason why the, uh, the, the model doesn't work well. So that's a little demo just showing you how, uh, how the code works. And all that code's out on GitHub. You can go play with it and make it better. Um, and talk a little bit about Redis AI so that we can understand how it works because I'm going to then uh, build my application on Redis AI. So Redis AI is a module that extends Redis. So modules are plugins that you can use to add capability to Redis. Um, all this is free and open source software, so you can go out and play with it, have at it. Um, so Redis AI adds AI capabilities to Redis. Specifically, it turns Redis into a model server. And what that means is that I can take my machine learning models, deploy them to Redis, and then uh, people can use Redis commands to invoke those models as opposed to taking a machine learning model, putting it in their Python application and invoking it, they can put it in Redis and call it over Redis protocols, uh, or RESP, RESP specifically, uh, to uh, access it from any language they want. So it lets you sort of containerize your models without containerizing your models. And uh, of course, it's Redis, so it's fast and easy to integrate with. Uh, Redis AI lets you do multiple backends. So you can have a TensorFlow model, a PyTorch model, and an Onyx model. So uh, if your data science team wants to change the uh, technology, the tech stack they're using, they can swap out the models. The developers don't have to do anything different. If the developers want to use something other than Python to talk to data science models, they can. They can use JavaScript. They can use whatever language they want to. They can use, what's a good example of a language that has poor data science support? Uh, Ruby? Ruby. Cool. Would be a good one. What's that? COBOL, right, Camille? Yeah, COBOL. What about COBOL? Well, uh, if you had a, a Redis client for COBOL, in theory, you could invoke models on Redis AI with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm not aware that there's a Redis client for COBOL. I, we thought about having me write one uh, just for kind of the fun of it, but I'm, I, I'm afraid I'm going to get stuck doing that then. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I've done a lot more Fortran than I have COBOL, yeah. um, but I wouldn't recommend that as a modern language either. <laughs> That's a fair point. I um, just mention this because uh, earlier this year I was coaching a team that was doing hybrid COBOL and data science. So. Oh, oh, really? That's really? interesting. So. In insurance industry? Uh, science. So, uh, you've probably heard of TensorFlow and PyTorch. I'm guessing a lot of people, have heard, everyone's heard of TensorFlow. PyTorch is a similar thing as TensorFlow. Onyx, you might not heard of. Onyx is the Open Neural Network Exchange. And it's sort of like a uh, standard model format that you can use for um, lots of different platforms. And so there's tools to convert to your models from TensorFlow to Onyx and from PyTorch to Onyx and from Scikit-Learn to Onyx and from Cafe to Onyx. And so Onyx becomes a sort of uh, standard that you can use that everything supports, which means basically you can run any model uh, on Redis AI. Uh, Redis AI introduces two new data types, uh, the tensor and the model. The tensor is just a multi-dimensional data structure for inputs to the model and for outputs to the model. And the model is the thing that does the actual predicting, the actual inferring. Using it's pretty simple. You uh, load a model using the AI model set command. You load a tensor using the AI tensor set command. So now we've got a model in there. We do that once usually, right? And then we load a tensor. We tell the model to run. We tell it, use this as an input tensor and write your outputs to this, to this tensor here. It writes it out. And then we go and read the output tensor. So that's it. Yeah. Right, write out my out input process output. Right. <laughs> Pattern is, is as old as, old, older than computer science. Uh, from a Redis, AI com Redis command line, uh, this is how it works more, more in detail. We, we call tensor set. We give it the key that we want to store it in, the Redis key. We give it the data type that it's going to contain, which is all the uh, favorite floats, uh, floating point and uh, you know, integers that we know and love. 
uh, and we give it a, the, the dimensions, the shape. This is how wide it is in each particular dimension. This is a two dimensional uh, tensor because it's got two values. You could have 12 values and have a 12 dimensional tensor. It doesn't matter. Uh, this has got a shape of two and a width of seven. That shape of two is for two classifications and uh, seven words. So this is uh, us, uh, you know, these are our two things that we want to classify, the two bits of speech, and then it's up to seven wide. So you see, we got a, the padded zeros there and everything. So we pass in the shape, we pass in the values, and it sets the tensor. Uh, you can actually set it as a blob as well, uh, programmatically, it's, and then pass in a string that is, represents the binary. Uh, that's not great for humans, but good for the computers. Uh, tensor gets, you just say A, tensor gets, and then the key. And then you say, uh, give me values. You can say also give me the blob. And you can also ask for metadata back. So the metadata will say, uh, tell you the shape and the data type it contains. So these are just getting and setting tensors. To actually uh, load a model, uh, I'm not using the Redis CLI internally. I'm using the CLI from the command line itself. And so I'm saying Redis CLI dash X, dash X says, if you do Redis CLI and then a command, it will run it. If you do dash X, it will run the command, but the last bit of the command will be the model, the file the, the read from standard in. So what we're doing here, we're setting the model, we're putting it in a key, we're selecting a backend, right? So our backend, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Onyx, uh, TensorFlow Lite. We say whether we wanna use the CPU or the GPU, the model determines that. And then we uh, pass in a file that is, is the model from the, the file system. To make uh, actually make an inference, to make a prediction, we call model run, pass in the key of the model we want to run, pass in the input tensor or tensors. Uh, you can input multiple tensors if your model supports that. And the key of the output tensor or tensors. In our case, our output's gonna have two values, um, you know, one for Shaggy and one for uh, Velma here one for each thing that we wanted to classify. So that's that's all the commands for Redis AI. Putting it all together, uh, we can build a little application where we type in uh, a, a word. We can send that off to Redis using these commands. We can, uh, Redis will then delegate that to Redis AI. Redis AI will then delegate that to the model, which will make a prediction, write, uh, write an output, return that through Redis AI, return that to Redis. And then our application can pull it back and we can find out that that was indeed Scooby who said Roke Raggy. So that's sort of Redis AI in five minutes. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna show you uh, now uh, the little application that I built that is fun and ridiculous that puts us all together um, for, uh, for this. So let me bring this back down here. So I showed you um, uh, the, the Python code to build these models, and, and it actually spits out these models right here. So if we look here on the left, uh, these are we got an Onyx model and a protobuf file representing the TensorFlow model. And so we could take those models. Uh, the code to save them is right here. Um, for Onyx, it's two lines. You know, you use Keras to Onyx, takes a Keras model, spits out an Onyx model, save the Onyx model to a disk. Easy peasy. Uh, to get it to work with TensorFlow is a little more involved because we have to freeze the uh, the graph and do a bunch of things that I don't really understand, uh, but I know that it works. Uh, and I know that I like using Onyx better, <laughs> honestly, because it's because it's easier and I'm a developer. Um, I have built a simple node application that will load these models. And let's see if I can find the code here. It's at server.js. And uh, it just goes through and uses um, a library called IO Redis to talk to Redis. And so we go through and we load up our, our models. Here's our call to AI model set uh, to load the Onyx model. This loads the TensorFlow model. Uh, that word index, uh, we saved that off so that we could use it in our application because we need to, to turn our words into numbers. And we uh, that classes file we saved as well because we need to turn our outputs into classes that uh, we can use to display something. We don't want just numbers, we want classes. Um, and this is just using a little express backend. And so uh, our one request that comes in, uh, we, we pass whether we're gonna use Onyx or uh, Py, um, TensorFlow. 
And then th this is actually, I think, kind of the most fun line of code because this is taking the line of text and turning it into the, the numbers that are gonna be input into this, uh, in, into this uh, model. And so we lowercase it all. And then I use a couple of regular expressions to get, uh, get rid of anything that aren't letters or numbers and to uh, make sure that we only have one character white space between each word, not multiple characters. And then I trim everything off the edges, split the words on space. And then I just uh, map the word, looking it up in that word index. And so that word index is gonna take like the and turn it into one and just take eyeballs and turn it into 2,100 and whatever it was. And if there's words it doesn't recognize, it's gonna return them into undefined. And so this last thing says, well, uh, if the index is undefined and undefined is falsy, <laughs> then, um, then it's zero, otherwise it's, uh, it's the index. So that just replaces all the undefines with zeros. That's all this guy, is doing. Guy, did someone code review this? You're evil. Now, shut up, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> This doesn't pass the 2 a.m. drunk contest. This yeah, doesn't yeah. pass the 9 p.m. drunk contest. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I try to do uh, is uh, I, when I write code for production, it's very different from how I write code for uh, for teaching how tooling works. And so having just sort of this linear thing that I can scroll through is easier to talk through with lots of comments. So um, just giving you a hard time. I know. That's why I told you to shut up. <laughs> So, um, and then we pad it and everything, like just like we did before. We call AI tensor set to set our tensor. We run the appropriate model, Onyx or TensorFlow. Uh, and then we call tensor get to get the value back out. And then we display the results. And so uh, on the front end, I've got a really boring app.js, which is 60 lines of code. It just basically hits a rest endpoint. It's not even rest. It's just, it's just RCP over HTTP. Right? It's not it's not actual proper rest um, that goes out and hits this little URL. So let's run it. So over here we've got we need to get Redis AI up and running first. So I've got a little shell script that I use to do that. Um, it goes ahead and runs Redis AI with from Docker with all the appropriate settings. And then uh, we can go ahead and start up our server uh, for our uh, or inf inference server. So that'd be uh, npm start, and that will run server.js. And then on my third terminal, I'm going to uh, launch the web client. And I'm going to use, uh, if you haven't seen this trick, this is great. Do python m http.server, and it creates a web server in that directory. This one only works with Python 3. It doesn't work with Python 2. There's another command for Python 2.x. But for Python 3.x, which is the one you should be using because Python 2 is bad and evil and old and we don't use it anymore, uh, this will work. And so this creates a web server in this folder. So now we've got a web server in this folder. I got another web server for that's handling the REST call. And then um, we got Redis up and running. So if we go to our browser here and I refresh this, we can see that indeed we have a web page here and we can type a line from Scooby-Doo and it will tell us who said it. What should we type? Jinkies maybe? We'll do Jinkies. And indeed that is Velma Dinkley. And we can do things like, like what are we gonna do now, Scoob? That would be shaggy, right? <laughs> uh, and it can take words that it doesn't recognize. So let's let's. Uh, I see a SpongeBob background there for Scott. So we'll do a SpongeBob, uh, uh, you know, crossover. Like, are we uh, goofy goobers, Scoob? Uh, I'm pretty sure the word goofy goofy might be in there, but goober probably isn't. And it still figures out that that's shaggy because that's the kind of thing Shaggy would say. Uh, we can say, uh, I can't be seen without my glasses. That's Velma, right? So it doesn't work too bad actually for being as, uh, only having a 44% accuracy based on <laughs> the, 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 the evaluation. However, uh, if you do something like this,
and it should be, I can't see without my glasses. I can't be see without my glasses. Just, just to be complete there, make sure that still says Velma. Now, if we add the comma Scoob, it thinks Shaggy said it. And this is that vanishing gradient problem that I was talking about earlier, right? This last word is just as important as all the previous words. Well, I was gonna ask you like, what if Scoob comes first, right? Is it weightless? Uh, yes. So this will probably be Velma. That says Velma. Uh, and it's because the word scoob is, so glass is, is half of the determination. My is 25%, this is 12 and a half percent, this is six and a quarter, uh, three and an eighth, whatever half of that, half of that again is. And so things more to the left are less important. And so right? Like like Scoob. What are we going to do about my glasses? That's probably going to come out as that's probably going to come out as Velma. And it does. What are we going to do about Velma's glasses? Still comes out. So, so this is that vanishing gradient problem uh, manifesting. But you know, all things considered, uh, given uh, given that this is rubber bands and uh, and hot glue, uh, I'm I'm kind of happy with it. <laughs> it. It gets their catchphrases. If I do, let's split up. No, no actually, hey gang. Let's split up. Figures out that's Fred. Uh, it doesn't do that well with Daphne. Like her catchphrase is Jeepers. And it doesn't attribute to, it to her. Um, and I think it's because Daphne has, uh, she tends to, she doesn't have as many catchphrases. And I don't think she really has as many lines. Like Shaggy and Scooby have more lines than everyone else. And one of the things I didn't do with the data, because I'm not a data scientist, and a data scientist would tell you you should do this, is you should balance the data and remove some of the examples uh, so that there's an equal number of Shags and Scoobs and Velmas and Daphnes and Freds in your data set. Otherwise, it'll be biased towards predicting one or the other. Diversity, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but that's my little example. If we go out and look at the command line uh, for the little node server I wrote, it's actually spitting out uh, all these answers. So um, that last one we did was, uh, it was only 53% sure that that was Shaggy. So it wasn't very sure. And then, uh, but Daphne was in the middle. And so, it, it, you know, uh, if we go ahead and say, Jeepers, they mean business. That's something that will come up as Daphne. So. Uh, and we can see here this it's fairly certain. But we so this thing spits out sort of a the score. So that's my uh, fun little demo. You're welcome to go play with it and pull that code down and make all this stuff work and make it better and do all those things. We've covered a lot of stuff. Neural networks, recurrent neural networks, Keras and Redis. I've got a bunch of links here if you want to go check some stuff out. Um, the the uh, you know, if you want to check out uh, Redis AI, it's redisai.io. Yeah, Redis itself can be got at redis.io. Uh, this is a Docker image you can use if you uh, like the Docker thing. And all of my code is right out here. So you go check that out. I've got, um, I, you know, I work for Redis Labs, obviously. Uh, we have a Discord server. Uh, go join our Discord server. I'm always on there. And if you have Redis questions, you can ask me or uh, another member of the team. Lots of people are there to help. Uh, we offer free Redis classes at Redis University. Um, so go sign up for free schooling. And uh, we got a bunch of videos out on our Redis University YouTube channel, uh, including uh, two on Redis AI that uh, I've recorded relatively recently and a third one on this way. So if you wanna uh, go a little bit deeper and learn a little bit more and uh, you don't have to get that, uh, get that one slide. This is the only slide you need to get all the stuff. This has the link to my GitHub repository, which has the slides and the code and my talk abstract and all those things. Uh, you can just use this QR code, which will never give you up, nor will it let you down. It's not going to run around or hurt you. It will actually take you to my GitHub repository. So that's pretty much all I got. 
Uh, Give me a follow on Twitter, please. And thanks.